Major funding for this special Frontline series is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Tonight, a Frontline special series of portraits of the people of the Soviet Union. It's called the Paris of the North, Estonia, the Soviet Union's most European republic. A special portrait of Krista Kayandu, a premier Soviet fashion designer. She works within the Soviet system to make fashion fantasies come true. Tonight, Baltic Sheep. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is a special Frontline series with Judy Woodruff. Good evening and welcome to Comrades, a special Frontline series on life in the Soviet Union. At a time when the world is wondering where is the Soviet Union heading, how far-reaching will the reforms of Mikhail Gorbachev be, and how lasting, we're bringing this series to you again because of its unique look at the lives of Soviet citizens. It offers rare insight into their dreams, their attitudes, their values. Comrades was made by a team of producers from the British Broadcasting Corporation. They spent two years traveling throughout the Soviet Union. They were allowed access, rarely granted a Western film crew. Tonight, the story of a fashion designer working in the Republic of Estonia on the Gulf of Finland. The film is called Baltic Chic. At the end, I'll be back to talk with the series producer and with two journalists who have reported from Moscow for years to measure the changes going on in Russia today and the impact of these changes on the people in this film. The film is narrated by Richard Denton. the capital of Estonia. It lies on the Baltic Sea, just 50 miles from Helsinki. Founded by the Danes 800 years ago, it's been a Russian possession for much of its history, but its culture and its style are European. For 20 years after the First World War, Estonia was independent, but the Soviet Union established a military base here during its war with Finland, and in 1940, formally annexed it. An estimated 80,000 Estonians escaped to the West. Those who remained behind haven't become any more Russian. Their own language is closer to Finnish, and they speak Russian only when they must. They can pick up Finnish television and watch programs like Dallas. And in the streets, the drabness you see in many Soviet cities is less pronounced. Indeed, to many Soviets, a trip to the Baltic states is the next best thing to traveling abroad. Tallinn is one of the centers of fashion in the Soviet Union. And this is the Tallinn Fashion House. Listen, darlings, find a black slip to go under this dress. This is the wrong one. Mela can show the black. Actually, she could show this one with the gray skirt. We put it over there. Krista Kayandu is the chief designer. She's about to show a number of designs to representatives from other Soviet fashion houses who happen to be in Tallinn for a trade fair. She speaks Estonian with her colleagues, Russian during the meeting. Did you manage to fulfill your plan? What? Yes, we did. Good for you. Well done. Only with the greatest difficulty. All fashion houses in the Soviet Union come under the Ministry for Light Industry. 
Like any other industry, they're given a plan with monthly production targets. And like any other industry, they often find the plan is the enemy of quality. What a beauty. As soft as anything. Yes, that fur is really soft. You can cut it like that. Oh, yes, the fur is very soft. It cost about a thousand rubles. Was it for an international exhibition? No, no, just for one of our shows. Oh, we'd be willing to travel abroad. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> We're certainly not against trips abroad. It makes us happy to hear from visitors that clothes are better here. And we hope that it's partly due to our fashion house. Maybe it's also got something to do with the fact that we are the Western Border Republic. Much of Krista's work as chief designer involves her supervising mass production in the clothing industry. Her team of designers at the fashion house spend most of the year creating designs for factories like this one. The problem is that their ideas are often hard for the clothing industry to execute because of the shortage of decent materials. The main thing, problem number one, is unquestionably fabric, because fashion depends entirely on the fabric. And if the fabric is no good, it's very hard to make a decent design. We've started working very closely with the garment factories. They've got their own good designers. It's not always a question of the designer, well, not being able to find a new approach. It's more to do with the machinery or the raw materials, maybe. In a design sense, the factory does come under the supervision of the Tallinn Fashion House and is required to buy a number of Christie's designs. She is genuinely interested in producing good clothes, but it's an uphill task. The factory has more in common with an industrial production line than haute couture. As if to underline that, the day is punctuated with the compulsory routines you see in all Soviet factories. Shall I sit? Sit over there in your usual place. Krista has a meeting with the factory's own designers. They must have their designs rubber stamped by Krista in her capacity as the head of the fashion house. Given the materials available and the needs of the plan, there's an enormous gap between the standards she accepts here and what she accepts from her own designers. Did they copy the fabric or did we? We wanted to try it. To see what it was like. Mm. Is the production better? Yes, how was it? Oh, you young angel, the damsel Ruth. What fabric is that? It's Narva. Oh, Narva. It comes in models 84 and 92. You're not making any more, are you? In personal terms, the highlight of her year is the Tallinn Fashion Show. For a designer, the fashion house is the most desirable place to work and the most sought after. Because there are factory designers too, but they don't get the chance to do fashion shows. And after all, fashion shows play a very important part in the life of a designer. Leonid Girin is Krista's top designer. 
is in fact a Russian, but has found a comfortable niche for himself in the more tolerant atmosphere of Estonia. His collection in this spring's fashion show will be coats. My swan song was really my last collection, black evening dresses. I think I fully expressed myself in it. You could wear them to some place like La Scala. The theme arose as a fantasy based on Italian opera, inspired by the dramatic heroines of Puccini, Verdi, La Traviata. As for the coat, it's, it's a very down-to-earth thing. I wouldn't say the material's all that good. It's a bit too loosely woven. But there's a tendency for coats to be rather amorphous. Buying clothes in the Soviet Union is a complicated business, particularly if you're interested in fashion. It is possible to buy one-off designs like these on display in the Tallinn Exhibition Hall, but the cost is enormous. At two, three, four, or even 500 rubles, that's about four months' average salary, it's an option only open to the privileged few. Some people buy foreign clothes on the black market. Others manage to find what they want, sifting through the mass-produced garments for sale in the ordinary shops. Many make their own clothes. The only thing anyone seems to be able to afford here are bracelets designed and made by Leonid. But even these cost $35 each. We should create better designs and be ahead of the times. Maybe that's why there's such a difference between what you see in the shops and what you see at the fashion shows. Of course, there's a difference and there should be. Otherwise, our work wouldn't be worth anything. Krista is doing her best to improve things for the ordinary fashion-conscious consumer. Under her leadership, the fashion house does produce clothes for the ordinary shops in limited editions of 300 or so. They're expensive, but compare reasonably well in price with the factory-made clothes available alongside them. Unlike many suppliers in the Soviet Union, Krista is interested in providing what the customer wants. I'm interested in that new jacket of ours. The first batch sold well. If we make more, we'll use more of that grey ester fabric. There's also a beige ester. What do you think? What about the checked blouse there with the low neckline? It doesn't sell at all. Is it the colour or the price, do you think? No, not the price. It's the colour. Probably because it's navy. The previous blouses, for instance, sold very well. The same design? No, a bit different. Red stripes and grey checks. That sold very well and was very well received. The sign that there is something on sale that people really want is this. The line. Soviet shoppers have a kind of sixth sense. In seconds, lines materialize out of nowhere. Today, the prize is a consignment of t-shirts, though the people at the back may not yet know this. The mere existence of a line in the Soviet Union is reason enough for joining it. Hello, darling. Give me a kiss. Krista's husband, Johan, is vice president of an organization that tries to maintain traditional Estonian folk art. But with Krista's big show approaching, it's her worries he listens to. There's some food prepared. I don't feel like cooking today. It's such a rainy day. I can't say which design worries me the most, you know. It's very difficult with Anu's collection. She's doing the finale. And it turns out her fabric's so transparent, she needs petticoats. Mm -hmm. Recently, I've been feeling that my work would be nearly impossible if I don't have you on by my side. 
I feel you just need someone's... How do you say it in Russian? Shoulder. Krista and Johan live outside town in their own house. There's the same complicated mixture of private and state housing here as in the rest of the Soviet Union. But finding accommodation in this small republic is less of a problem than in most of European Russia. Much of the accommodation available here dates from the pre-Soviet era and has more in common with Scandinavia than it does with Russia. People often own their own homes. They're not allowed to buy or sell them for personal profit, but they are allowed to swap with other people to suit personal needs. We swapped our apartment with a distant relative. He got our small room and we got his small house. Then we tried to do a bit to it to the best of our ability. To build parts on it, reconstruct it. Every year we travel somewhere far away where it's quiet. Where there aren't any people and there's just nature. On weekends we just stay at home. I knit for myself and for you on too. Just pour a bit of water on. Okay. A bit more. The sauna is as important to Estonians as it is to their neighbours in Finland and Scandinavia. Many own their own. Near Krista's home is the Tallinn State Poultry Farm, where 1,200 people live and work. Krista comes here once a week to teach the women workers to knit. It's that curious Soviet phenomenon, a voluntary obligation, from which everyone gets something. The farm workers get knitting lessons from a top designer, and Krista gets fresh eggs and chickens in return. I'm not sure I like this. Why? I really like this color. Recently, everyone started getting interested in fashion. Journalists and newspapers and radio too. Not only in the fashion shows or in lectures either. People are just talking more about fashion altogether. This week, Krista has got her pupils some tickets for the fashion show. Is it in the town hall? No, in the sports hall. Don't go to the wrong place. Much of Tallinn is modern. A sprawling post-war development that looks like any number of reconstructed Soviet cities. But the local Estonian authorities have kept the new town separate from the old. They're an independent people. Not long ago, a top Estonian official defected to the West, and the Kremlin issued a decree ordering the local party to pay more attention to communist indoctrination and the job of inculcating a spirit of Soviet patriotism among Estonians. The United States has never recognized the incorporation of Estonia into the Soviet Union, and the old government still has an embassy in Washington. Estonians still flee the country by crossing the bay to Finland. Over here. I've got a feeling the shoulders will sag. Yes, it does fall forward. Three days to go before the fashion show. Leonid's coats are almost ready. A coat is no longer an essential garment these days. It can now be more of a unique item. 
So nowadays, if you have a coat, there's a tendency for it to be luxurious and particularly suited to your personal taste. It'll be ready by two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Snaps will hold it all together. Pia here seems to have very long arms and legs. The difference is really only three quarters of an inch, but it looks much more. Yes, yes, we must get Melly to try it on. But there's a lot to be done before they're ready for the show. Some of the designs are still being made up. to bring the clothes containers over here. There are two big jobs on today. I know, but then they took the carpets and the parts have to be fetched. So they're taking the containers back and forth. Why can't you all come now and bring someone with him? Is there no one now at all? Hello there, boy. You can't come in through there. On the day of the show, they just get the morning for rehearsal and final adjustments. Johan will come along in the afternoon for the show itself. Darling, will you make coffee or must I? to go left a bit. Straighten it up. Bring the stuff in from the back. What are we doing now? 
Still at home, preparing breakfast, Krista seems unruffled by the tight schedule. Maybe not surprisingly, since so little depends on it. Tallinn may call itself the Paris of the North, but this is not the cutthroat world of Parisian couture. The show will be an indulgence, an uncompetitive nod towards a world from which they're excluded. Go on, take a bit more. Let's crack the eggs. Which is the sharp end? Here. I'll crack it. Let me crack it. Now crack it on me. What again? The egg cracking is an old Easter ritual that still survives. I want more coffee. Mm. This egg's blue inside. It isn't, you silly. Hurry, hurry. We must pull the pillars forward. Yes, that's right. And what about the corners? Keep it like that. One by one, the fashion house designers make their way to the sports hall, where with only a few hours to go, it looks unlikely that things will ever be ready in time. Now, lift it carefully. This one goes over there. There's something unreal about the fashion show in Tallinn. The general public is encouraged to come, but it won't be able to buy what it will see here. Factory representatives will attend, and they will be able to buy some of the designs. But so cumbersome is the system, they'll be out of date long before they emerge in the shops. Besides, the shortage of good materials will mean that the finished clothes will bear little resemblance to the original. <laughs> The fashion house employs only four full-time mannequins. Most of the models are amateurs. Among them, a taxi driver, an elevator operator, and several students. Dressing up comes more naturally to some than to others. Girls, come and get your evening dresses. Whose suit is that? Any tickets left for today at all? Some for the second show only. I'll take two then, please. Many of the tickets have been given in advance to factory representatives and people in the textile business. For the ordinary public, tickets cost $1.50, and they're in demand. 
as there's no shortage of curiosity among the women of Tallinn. Inside, a last-minute rehearsal. Not necessary. Do as you like. Then I'll put one hand on my pocket. Yes, maybe have your fingers showing over the pocket. A few plans may have been earmarked for the wife of an important official, even made especially to her size. But for the most part, this is just a stitched together demonstration, a chance for the designers to spread their wings a little, to show what they'd like to be doing if things were different. Of course I'm a little nervous, as always. I hope it'll go all right today. I would like the models to have a more professional approach, to be more synchronized in their movements. Usually the first show is just so-so. Once they've done it a few times, they know what's expected, and it's much better. You're all coming out at once? No, we're coming in pairs. Five go to the right, and five to the... Yes, yes. The question is where we're all standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just turn all together like soldiers. Mm -hmm. When you come out, keep smiling. Keep smiling. That's the main thing. Just a few minutes to go now and the show will begin with a statement, a display of Estonian national costumes, something very close to Krista's heart. We have good and beautiful traditions, and they must be preserved. The theme of national costume always interests me. I've designed that collection myself three times before. You always approach this particular theme with such respect that you even, well, with a bit of fear to spoil it. Because we like our national costumes very much. And we are afraid of not doing it the best possible way. As the audience take their seats, the announcements are made, first in Estonian and then in Russian. Our collection has been prepared under the supervision of the Tallinn Fashion House's chief designer, Krista Kajandu. Dispose of his designer stubble. 
This collection of early summer overcoats made of woven angora from the December 5th textile factory is designed by Leonid Guerin. The artificial leather edges are a decorative and practical solution for a coat without a lining. Help! Don't let me be filmed naked. Don't be shy. One can show the English beautiful flesh. Theirs isn't like this. This was spring 1985, but to the fashion critics in the West, many of the clothes probably looked dated even then. To people in the audience in Tallinn, they're tantalizing, the stuff of dreams. To Krista Kayandu, they're a start, something to make people think about fashion, to make them ask for something more in the shops than the generally drab clothes available now. finale is a collection of fantasies. Exotic evening dresses for those occasions you never go to. Maybe the gap between these clothes and the woman in the Soviet street is no greater than that between Christian Dior and the average shopper in the West, but there's more to it here in Tallinn. This is a chance to forget. To forget the plan, the quotas and next month's schedule. 
A chance to use your imagination, to break ranks, a chance to be different. That was Baltic chic. We'll talk about fashion and life in the Baltic republics with three people who know something about the Soviet Union. David Shipler was New York Times correspondent in Moscow from 1975 to 1979. He's the author of the book, Russia, Broken Idols, Solemn Dreams. Paul Quinn Judge is now Moscow correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. And Richard Denton is the series producer for Comrades. Richard, why profile a fashion designer? What does this tell us about the Soviet Union? Well, on a superficial level, as a man, I didn't need an awful lot of excuse to go down to <laughs> Estonia and film beautiful women in nice clothes. Um, but, of course, the film isn't actually about fashion designers or about um, nice clothes or, indeed, exclusively about women. It's mostly about life in a different Soviet republic, which is remarkably different because it's essentially a very bourgeois and middle-class European Republic as opposed to the kind of um, Russian Republic. Is that why you chose Estonia? That's why we or wanted did you choose? Did you we wanted to go to one of the Baltic Republics. This was the excuse to go there. The choice actually was between a fashion designer and um, a club that specialized in the restoration of old cars. What would you have chosen? <laughs> <laughs> we chose a fashion designer. And she's a great character, again, and in, enables you to get into families and get into people and all the usual reasons. But basically, the most important thing was to get in, into the Baltic Republics because they're very important. Now, just one other point on her, though. Krista, this was filmed three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. what is, what's the latest on her? Is she still doing what we saw her doing in the, in the She's film? still doing uh, what you see her doing um, there. And in fact, at this precise moment, you won't be able to contact her. She and her husband are on holiday in Florida. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. And that says a lot about the difference between the Baltic Republics and other parts. I mean, in their whole attitude to life, their whole attitude to what they expect out of life. They watch Western television. They, uh, they're much more closely related to us than they are to their um, four-legged four friends on the other side of the border, as Paul, they call them. Uh, Paul, uh, how different is, are the Baltic Republics, Estonia in particular, from the rest of the Soviet Union? Well, I think the film showed it very well, and even though the film was shot well before the disturbances in the Baltic states, it underlined some of the problems that have come to the surface more recently. Um, you notice that there was one of the ethnic Russians in the film, the um, coat designer, Leonid, was speaking Estonian to the Estonian personnel. If you don't speak, if you try to speak Russian anyway to Estonians, you don't always get a very warm welcome. Leonid has obviously learned that rather fast. Um, Krista and her husband are very much involved in preserving national traditions. And that's, that's been a l very long-standing concern of, of not only the Estonians, but the Latvians and the Lithuanians. Um, they feel themselves to be very different. They've only been part of the Soviet Union since 1940. They feel, many of them feel that they became part of the Soviet Union by force of arms, not mm -hmm. by um, any political uh, sympathy for the system on their part. Those are the problems that are coming up to the surface, but as the film shows, were there a long time ago. Is that similar to the feelings that you, that we understand have come in Azerbaijan, for example, where recently we've had disturbances, seri very serious disturbances? I mean, are you talking about similar feelings of nationalism? Yes and no. Nationalist feelings. They've come to the surface partly because the response of the Gorbachev regime is not to send the tanks in if somebody gets out of line. A few years ago, I don't think people would have demonstrated in, in uh, Armenia the way they did recently. Mm -hmm. They certainly wouldn't have done it for very long. Um, the disturbances in the South, though, were much more historical tensions between two non-Russian ethnic groups, the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis, and these tensions go back before the revolution. In the case of the Baltic states, the, these are people who have only been part of the Soviet Union for 30-odd years, mm. 38 years not the 60, 70 that the, um, the southern republics have. David, what's your sense? You were in the Soviet Union in the late 70s, uh, that was a decade ago. What's your sense of how much things have changed? Uh, I don't think that things period? have changed uh, in fact, but I think they've changed in the way they're being expressed. As Paul mentioned, the, the move toward glasnost or openness begins to allow the expression of certain ideas and tensions that were suppressed earlier. 
Um, when I was there, there were movements of nationalism, certainly in various republics. The Georgians were very active. In fact, when, um, when Shevardnadze was the party chief in Georgia, which was when I was there, um, he was the object of uh, a lot of demonstrations uh, against him because he was trying to stamp out corruption, which in the Soviet definition, which translated for the Georgians into private enterprise. Uh, and uh, there were some bombings, uh, there, were some, there was some arson. Uh, when the new Soviet constitution was written and the republic constitutions were also revised, the Georgians, quite a few Georgians, demonstrated in front of the Central Committee headquarters in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, against a provision uh, in the constitution that dropped Georgian as the official language of the republic. Mm. It was a symbolic thing, but... Uh, and they changed the they changed the provision. They put it back in. So it's it's been there all along. Uh, there's great potential. The in that, feeling, the, the, the feelings feeling, yeah. have been there. Yeah, but in other ways, it's changed quite remarkably. I mean, you now have the situation whereby the party chief in Latvia, who was a former KGB um, senior official in Moscow, and then was a KGB chief in Latvia, was saying after demonstrations last year that he was very unhappy with the demonstrations, but to the extent that they were anti-Stalinist, he understood their motivations. Um, that, that had officials in Latvia rolling their eyes and saying, last year we wouldn't have been able to say this. Um, in Estonia, you've got to the point where a few months ago they published the figures for the number of people deported by Stalin in 1940, and um, more mm. people deported at the end of the 40s, gave the official figures and proceeded to debunk the official explanation of these deportations in the past. It was a sort of preemptive strike of anti-Soviet elements. And you now have official Estonian historians saying this version is wrong. Well, it, ahead, it, it's very interesting. I mean, I think it's one of the most sort of volatile areas at the moment. I mean, even when I've been there, and I've been there back to Estonia only a few months ago, uh, as soon as you get on the train to go to the Baltic, you're in a different country. You know, there are flowers on a little vase on your table in the train, there are biscuits, and somebody comes up and asks you, what would you like? You know, you're Is that immediately into... they are economically better off overall? Than they the are just the culturally system? entirely different. They're much culturally closer to Western European countries and, and to our values and our structures and our but sense I mean, of what is important. But to be able to important. afford to buy nicer clothes occasionally, to be able to afford to put flowers in, in a vase, and so, I mean, some of that costs money, doesn't it? It's less money than taste and tradition, it seems taste to me. Taste and tradition, and when, yeah, it's very when you go from Moscow to Tallinn, you are, you do feel as if you're going from east to west. Uh, Out in, of a proletarian a, culture into a bourgeois yeah, one. That's afraid, right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Very comfortable too sometimes. <laughs> that's right. Well, how far can, can it go? I mean, we, Gorbachev has talked a lot about, about know, I, I uh, letting that, there be more openness. How, how far can these people in the, in the uh, in Baltic this, republics go? They are pushing the limits as far as they can, and I think they're, they're trying to find out. Nobody knows how far he or she can go in any f sphere of Soviet life at the moment. But a lot of people are trying very far, very hard to find out how far they can go. In Estonia, they've called, a group of intellectuals has called for something akin to economic autonomy. A lot of Estonians are saying we would like to be autonomous within the Soviet Union. To one degree, they're being moderate, and they're not saying we want to secede, but on the other uh, to the other degree, they're saying we want to have our own lifestyle. See, the, secession, the, 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 yeah. secession would be the red line, certainly, or, or that is any movement toward that. I mean, but in, in principle, past, isn't secession possible? I mean, under it, the Constitution, it, under the Constitution yes. they, all, these, all these republics voluntarily Which joined the Soviet, the Soviet Constitution. Constitution. All these republics voluntarily joined the Soviet Union and an, could voluntarily leave it. But the Soviet Constitution makes wonderful reading. Uh, mm -hmm. There are lots of interesting articles in it. My favorite is the one that provides for the privacy of uh, private communications, telephone, telephone conversations. Yes, yes, yes. So, so much for that. But I think that... Well, there are uh, more than three people on the same line. Right. <laughs> you know, each national group has its own relationship with the Great Russians. It's very difficult to make a generalization. What do you mean by Great Russians? Well, the Great Russians meaning the ethnic Russians. We, we speak of Russians Not a value meaning, judgment. <laughs> meaning Soviet, Soviet citizens, mm -hmm. but in fact mm -hmm. about half mm -hmm. the Soviet population is ethnically Russian. The rest are sprinkled among uh, more than a hundred nationalities who have, many of whom retain their own languages and, and their own cultures. And if you go to Moldavia, for example, you find a much more accommodating uh, atmosphere between Moldavians and Russians. I remember being there once in, in the party newspaper 
uh, was the, lang the Moldavian language newspaper in Kishinev, and the editor was t speaking to his secretaries in Russian, even though they were all Moldavians. And I asked him, I said, why are you doing this? Why don't you speak Moldavian? He said, that's the language for the home. Russian's the language for business. Well, if you're Gorbachev, how, how do you know how far to let this go? I mean, how, how do you know how far to let the string... Unravel. This is a dangerous it's, area. It's a dangerous game. It's a this dangerous a, game. This is, this all, all, his, all these games are dangerous, but right now his greatest skill is that he's a very good improviser. Um, I think in the Baltic states, in some ways, the whole idea of glasnost has come up, has hit the regime by, from behind. Because if in the rest of the country there are a lot of things that you can discuss, but you, you would not end up crit um, questioning the legitimacy of the regime, in the Baltic states, they are now admitting that in the 30s, many of the Baltic communists were killed by Stalin. They are now admitting that immediately after the voluntary integration of the three states into the Soviet Union, lots of people were deported. They've more or less undercut their own legitimacy. And this is why it's so tight for Gorbachev. But that there. doesn't threaten the current regime in the Soviet Union, does it? Yes, because the regime is very much dependent on the whole idea of legitimacy. Um, a lot of the party leadership would be very unhappy if you got to the point where you were questioning the rectitude of the past leadership in their formation of the Soviet and Union. You, you have to remember that any future leader of the Soviet Union will come from the ranks of the people who are around Gorbachev at the moment. And if they feel, if, if a sufficient dis degree of discomfort about what is happening either in the Baltic re republics or down in Azerbaijan and Armenia and that the situation is getting out of control, the man can be replaced. I think it's, it's a question of the extent to which the centrifugal forces that operate in that society would begin to have uh, relatively free reign, for example, in a situation of crisis, of economic crisis, of warfare. Uh, in other words, to, at what point would the, the empire begin to split apart? And that must be a subject of some concern for a leadership that has traditionally regarded its own power as rather precarious. You know, from our viewpoint, or even from most Russians' viewpoint, I suppose, uh, sitting at the ground level looking up, it looks like an in, uh, a leadership or a power of enormous weight and, and stability. From the top, I think traditionally, there's been a sense of vulnerability. And mm. so that you, when you begin to see fissures developing in uh, the the, the, the co otherwise cohesive nature of the society, uh, it begins to get look very frightening. And it seems to me that, that the non-Russians who live under Soviet domination, both inside the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, uh, represent uh, perhaps the Achilles heel of this policy of openness uh, to which mm. Gorbachev is moving. And they're very aware, too, that by the year 2000, non-Russians will outnumber Russians inside the Soviet Union. I mean, it's a sort of statistical game. Are you game. saying that literally, that they all literally realize that, or are you just saying they generally know that at some point... Uh, they're they're aware of it. They're aware of it. And, and these kind because of... Because it's been published, it's been talked mm. about? Or, well, the uh, census uh, figures show a declining proportion of Russians in the population as a whole. The birth rates in Central Asia, for example, are much higher than in European Russia. So it's an inevitable demographic uh, fact yeah. that, that it will happen. Well, this is why I suspect that you can only guess that uh, some people in the leadership are arguing that it's much better to have these problems early on in a reform process and before they start facing any form of demographic crisis rather than, than have similar problems in 1998. When they're outnumbered. Mm -hmm. when, well, A, when they're outnumbered, B, when their economy is somewhere near, near a state of total collapse. I think that right now they feel that these are tolerable costs to, p to pay for a um, reviving of a, of a system which gives people more initiative and gets them working. The what tensions, ethnic tensions uh, in that society are, I think, probably as severe as they are in almost any multi-ethnic culture. Uh, it's just that uh, they haven't been allowed to find expression uh, until fairly recently. They do find expression in, in rather benign forms, that is, in political maneuvering for a share of the of the resources, of the pie. You know, there's a, a lot of jockeying for budgetary priorities and that kind of thing. But when you begin to have events such as those in Armenia but, and, and clashes between Azerbaijanis and Armenians, then a society that's been closed uh, for so long and is kind of groping toward a more open status has to learn how to cope in a, in a different way. And, and that's a very serious challenge. Mm -hmm. For both for them and for the people at the center.
Well, gentlemen, thank you all once again. Paul Quinn Judge, David Shipler, Richard Denton, thank you all for being with us. I'm Judy Woodruff for Frontline. Thank you and good night. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this special Frontline series was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. For a transcript of this program, please write to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. For video cassette information about this program, write to Films Incorporated, 1213 Wilmette Avenue, Wilmette, Illinois, 60091. This is Valera Krylov. He's 18 years old and about to go through a Soviet rite of passage. Two years away from his family at military service. A rare look at the life of a recruit in the Soviet Army, at a journey that every young Soviet man must take. Watch Soldier Boy next time on Comrades, a special frontline series.